are a family. We don't believe in just you coming to church so you can get some good feeling to take home. You know, you come to church to give. And I appreciate that contribution by uh, Ian. You know, whenever... Whenever the older guys and the most experienced guys, you know, uh, speak and they speak about their life, there's something so powerful about that. Because you can be talking about concepts and ideas that you come out, or insights and whatnot, but when you speak about is real, there's just nothing else better than that. So I appreciate you, Ian, uh, giving us that contribution. And so I hope that, you know, moving forward, guys, whenever we come, we're going to fill up the front seats first. Amen? You guys with me? And uh, sit together as a family. Whether you know the person next to you, you're going to hold their hand and pray with them. And we're going to show them the love of God just like God has shown us His love. Are you guys with me? So uh, the title of today's lesson is Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. And uh, we are continuing on our miracle series. We are now in class 20 of our miracle series. So we're going to be looking at the miracles surrounding the life of this guy named Samson. I think everyone knows about Samson, right? He's not Conan the Barbarian. He's Samson, right? Samson. Amen. Amen. Uh, Judges 13, Judges 14. We're going to look at the angel in the flame, the lion slain by Samson. We're going to look at the 30, 30 Philistines killed by Samson. We're going to look at the water from the hollow place, Lehi. City gates carried away by Samson. Dagon's house pulled down by Samson. All these great things that God did through this man named Samson. You know, Samson, just to give you a bit of a context before we jump in. Uh, Samson was the last of all of Israel's judges. So before Israel had a king, God appointed judges to lead the people. Because, you know, people always need leading. Are you guys with me? Yeah. And uh, so he was the last one before the first king of Israel was appointed. Wow. And he was a Nazarite. Now, in Judges 13, verse 4, if you're here and you're visiting, nudge the person next to you uh, who's a member of the church. Have them send you the lesson because that's where all the scriptures and notes are in. Judges 13, verse 4. It says, now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, that you do not eat anything unclean. And that's what it means to be a Nazirite. So you're preserving yourself from all these things to be fully dedicated and fully holy to the Lord. And uh, as a result, he was given immense strength to aid him against his enemies and to allow him to perform superhuman feats. I think one of the great things about human beings is that God has given us the ability to do the impossible. So the book in Genesis, God says when the people were united, they were going to build a pillar that was going to reach heaven. And God was like, man, if they are that united, they will actually achieve their objective. Wow. There is no limit to what you can do as a human being. The only limit there is, is what you believe and what you think of yourself. You know, and this included slaying a lion with his bare hands. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever seen a guy slay a lion with bare hands? Yeah. Like, just grab the lion and just rip them to pieces, right? Um, I kind of wish I had that strength, you know? I tried it with the first uh, dog, because in Samoa they have really bad dogs, right? Those dogs, you know, they're not pets. They're not nice. If you've lived in Samoa, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, you try to pat them, they'll bite you. And so I try to do that with a dog. Amen. Like, I love dogs now. I've, I've repented. I'm a Christian. But when I was a non-Christian, I was like, let me try it with a dog. And it didn't work out very well, as you can imagine. Right? However, if Samson's long hair were cut, then his nuts to right vow would be violated, and he would lose his strength. Yeah. So that's what the whole him having a long hair was all about. Samson, we find out from the Bible that he was betrayed by his lover Delilah, who sent, you know, the, who the uh, Philistines sent, hey, go find out the secret to her, uh, his strength. And so she finds out, tells them, they come, cut his hair, and then they gouge out his eyes, forcing him to grind grain and mill at Gaza. That's crazy. You may wonder, why the eyes? Well, if you study out the Bible, you'll find out Samson's downfall started all from his eyes. The lust of the flesh, the lust in terms of sexual lust. His sin was all sexual sin. And not only that, it's a warning to us that when we choose ungodly partners, it will lead to our demise. You know, I was sharing with the man on, uh, on Wednesday, um, you know, I try to look up some uh, facts about, you know, where the world is at or not. And I found out actually the rate of divorce has actually gone down. Good news, right? Yeah. Wrong. No one's getting married. That's why. No. So because they're not getting married, there's not that much divorce going on. Wow. But people have given up on it. 
Yeah. Why? Because almost every one to two people will end up being divorced. Mm. Yeah. People in this room as well. And it may not be 10 years time or 5 years time or maybe even 2 years time. But it may be even 30 years time and those ones are the worst. Mm. But you got to choose right. Because mm. they say, you know, if there's anything that can break a man or a woman, it's their marriage. Yeah. As your marriage goes, so does your life, most of the time. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, as I preach up here, I'm very grateful for my wife, my wife Jenna. And, uh, I mean, it's an understatement to say I chose right. <laughs> or let's just say, you know, I say uh, the Lord chose right for me. Um, but I, I, I shared the story with my staff earlier this week about how there was a period in time when we were dating. And Jenna will be the first one to say as well, alongside myself, that our dating relationship, we were struggling, you know. <laughs> it wasn't, we weren't clicking on certain parts and whatnot, and we weren't getting along. Like, we had great times, don't get me wrong. We had great times, and then there were times where we were just like, and it got to a point where we were like, do I really want to be with her? And this, she was thinking the same thing. She's like, do I really want to? And I'll never forget, I was uh, in the room with uh, Joe and Carrie, uh, our dear friends who lead our church in Sydney and we were having counseling time and they were trying to counsel me with uh, towards my relationship with Jenna and then I was giving all these issues you know being a sinful man you kind of give all the issues and not the good stuff and then uh, Carrie just sat back and she was quiet the whole time and at the end of it Joe was like any thoughts Carrie and Carrie was like you know what everything you said Scotty is true that's true everything that you mentioned about Jenna but you know one thing that's why I really appreciate and I admire that girl so much. She could be stuck in a corner sucking her thumb with tears running down her eyes. But she will never, ever, ever give up on God. That woman loves God. It's like, you are right about it. But that's the one thing I admire about her. Is that she will fight tooth and nail out of that corner because she loves God. And best to say, you know, after all these years, we've been married for about four years now, going into five. Um, every single year as it goes by I, I, I'm not saying this because you know of the claps and whatnot but I genuinely believe every single year I'm like man I made the right decision the next year I feel even deeper it's like I made the right decision it's like praise the Lord you know um, you know while there Samson's hair begins to grow again so he now is then captured and enslaved by the Israelites and then his hair starts to grow again and so because now he, his eyes have been gouged out he's lost his strength he's lost everything he gets humble before the Lord and go and begs God one last time. Like, God, please, allow me one last time the super strength so that I can die with my enemies. In Judges 13 verse 5, it says he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So this was a prediction made for Samson. And at the end of his life, although how messed up and how wrong his decision making was, God ended up achieving the purpose for why he was created. What is my point with that? All in all, when you study out the life of Samson, um, is an overall story of this title, Amazing Grace. Um, he was chosen for greatness by God. Yet all through his life, he had made bad decisions upon bad decisions, especially when it came to his love, love life. You know, maybe you're here this morning and you felt like, yeah, I've just made some bad decisions and whatnot. Sometimes we're so proud of our bad decisions, like, yeah, I've been through a lot, you know. It's like, it's, like, it's your fault you've been through a lot, you know. Um, and sometimes we may have had bad decisions that we make because of our bad backgrounds. Yeah. That should never, ever define you. Right. God's grace should be the defining point mm. in your life. Are you guys with me, church? Yeah. You know, this guy was self-centered and disrespectful, especially to his parents. God used him, despite his weak character, to achieve God's will for Israel. You know, his is a life that should inspire us to make good decisions rather than bad ones. But it's also a reminder that no matter what bad decisions you make, God does not give up on using you. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. I think one of the greatest things about God, especially in being a Christian, you can just draw a line in the stand and start fresh. Yeah. Whether you're 21 years old, whether you're 17, whether you're 60 years old, mm. it doesn't matter. You can still do great things yeah. in the eyes of God. Right. That's it. If you trust in His amazing grace. You know, I, sometimes I pray, I always thank God for, I don't know if you've ever thought about it or for the 24 hour period 
how it turns from morning and light to darkness. And I don't know about you, but for me personally, I believe the reason why God made it that way, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of different reasons why. But one of the big reasons why God created uh, morning and night is so that you can, whatever, if you had a bad day, you can go home, sleep, wake up, it's a new day. Come on. I mean, he could have made the day go on forever, right? Until you die. But for some weird reason, he made night and day. And it's so to give us this concept that, hey, whatever your issues were, just head to bed. Rise up, it's a new morning, it's a new sunrise, it's a new sunshine, it's a new beginning. Are you guys with me? Point number one, God has an amazing plan for your life. Um, I want to encourage you, whatever plans that you have for your life, I hope you left it out that door. Because they're not amazing, right? They're not as amazing as you think it is. Why? Because so many people achieve the very plans that you are going for and still they don't think their lives are amazing. In Judges chapter 13, verse 19 to 20, it says, Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. So this is before Samson was born. And it says, And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched as a flame blazed from the altar toward heaven. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. You know, what's happening here is that an angel appears to Manoah and his wife and goes, Hey, you are going to be brought to you a son named Samson. And he's going to deliver all the Israelites. And now Manoah and his wife are like, No, this is awesome. And then they go and make an altar of sacrifice to God to honor God. And as they made this altar and the fire was coming up, this angel just comes and just goes straight. I mean, that's an epic scene right there. So right from the beginning, we find that Samson's life, God was showing those around him that he was destined for greatness. Every human being that was created by God, whether you were born in a poor country, or a, a rich country, or a bad background, or a good one, a healthy one, an unhealthy one, whether you've been in an unhealthy relationships, God has destined every single person in this room greatness. You know, as proof of this, God sent an angel like we talked about. You know, overall, the circumstances before Samson's birth was amazing. And I think one of the things you got to think about, guys, is that in the same way when uh, Samson's birth was amazing, um, in your spiritual birth, everything is amazing around it. I don't know if you know, but there is no such thing as a boring conversion story. Yeah. Have you guys heard of a boring conversion story? No, no there isn't. Every conversion story is amazing. Right. Why? Because it's God that makes these things happen. Yeah. You know, I know for Dante's uh, conversion story, he uh, was walking alongside, he was just having a holiday in Sydney, and then uh, one kid goes up to him, hey, would you want to study the Bible? Reads the first passage, goes, I am lost, I am going to hell, I need to repent. Takes a week off work, studies the Bible, and gets baptized. <laughs> But if you ask him about that, you, and then you ask him about maybe two weeks or a year before all of that happened, God had been working in his life. Yeah. God uh, pushed him, disciplined him, you know, brought in some suffering of what, of what sort, and he got to a point where I'm just empty. I need to seek God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was interesting. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we got time with the Clegs as well. And uh, with Margot, don't be fooled with a smile, you know. <laughs> Margo's got a sweet mama-like style, you know, and like smile, and you know, you want to just give her a hug and cut her like it's mom, right? You find out her backstory, oh, it ain't pretty, you know? I remember we were, she was telling us about her, uh, her background, and I was like, Margo, you did that? I mean, I never react, you know, like that in someone's sin and whatnot, but I was like, I like you, you know? <laughs> Um, but I remember she was telling us, you know, when she got converted, she was, uh, had stayed up all night partying and was drunk. Um, and correct, sorry, forgive me if I get this detail wrong. And she was on her way, and she had been invited by someone else to go to church at one point. And then she was on her way, I think she was trying to go find a friend or find where this church was at. And then uh, two sisters from our church uh, was walking by and, you know, seeing this woman, most likely, like, wasn't dressed well because she had just finished partying. And, you know, like, maybe, she, I don't know, maybe she was dirty and sweaty and whatnot because it's been a whole night of no shower, you know? It's like, hey, would you like to come to, would you like to come to church? And she goes, okay. She rocks up to church. She's like, what's going on? But, you know, it's not bad, you know? <laughs> and then later on, she spends that whole afternoon with these random women. They went out to lunch. They, they had time together. They just uh, talked and talked and talked. And she was like, what am I even doing here? And then later on, studies the Bible for that week and the next week, and then she gets baptized. <laughs> 
Was that Mago? Was that those sisters? Or was that God? God does amazing things when it comes to converting you. You know, all conversions are a miracle of God, not us. You being fruitful is a miracle of God. That's why we include it in our miracle list. You know, God made, moved amazingly in your life so you would go on and do amazing things for Him. Do you believe that? You know, maybe you haven't seen those amazing things that God has done. Well, then that's why you got to study the Bible and then you'll start to see it unfold. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. You know, uh, we got together with a brother, sadly, that was part of the church and left and whatnot yesterday. And he made a comment, and I didn't respond back because I was like, oh, I'm not going to cause any trouble or anything because it's getting to a point where it's point. And he said, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, life, life as a Christian is way harder than a non-Christian. And I remember just thinking about that when I went home. I was like, that's actually not true. Yeah. There is equally hard. Right. You know what's even sometimes more harder than being in the light? It's being in darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Being in darkness, not knowing really where you're going. Mm -hmm. Not knowing if the person that you've married is going to leave you after 20 years. Mm -hmm. Not knowing if this person truly, genuinely loves you and is getting any help to help sustain your relationship. Wow. Come on. That's what's hard. Mm -hmm. Is living in this darkness, not knowing where the plans are going. Right. And you may convince yourself going, I know where I'm going. No, you don't. Most people say that and then they end up finding the truth. You know, and I think what's good uh, to really ask yourselves this morning is, are you living an amazing life? If you're not, it's because you're not living the amazing plan. Wow. You know, the amazing race, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's no amazing race than the race of Christianity. Are you guys with me? Um, you know, even uh, it was awesome. Uh, even the past week, I got to go to Aaron and Fung's house. And uh, I don't know if you guys have been to Aaron and Fung's house now. Like, it's transformed. You know, they've got some new cranking couches, some new, like, this big rug and whatnot. And I was just like, how much did that cost? And they were like, we got it for free. <laughs> I was like, what, really? You know, and I was just like trying to feel up on those couches. I'm like, dang. And, I, you know, and for the first time, I believe that we're going to get free couches as well, you know? Yeah. I went to my wife that day. It's like, honey, I believe in what you believe in. She's like, what? <laughs> I believe we're going to get a free couch. And she's like, I've been preaching that the whole time, you know? Uh, but, you know, do you believe you can live an amazing life? Come on, Sonny. And if you're not, my encouragement and challenge to you is get right with God. Yeah. Is get right with God. Nothing else is more amazing than experiencing God's amazing grace and living out His amazing plan. Point number two. God gives you an amazing spirit. Woo. Judges 14 verse 5 to 6. We're going to take a look at the action or the feats of the Spirit of the Lord on Samson. It says, Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands and he might have a torn, might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. To a non-Christian, like a non-Israelite, or I mean, Samson at this time, he was rude. He was just emotional. He was just plain ignorant. And he was an idiot of a man. And also at the same time, he was going against the command of God to marry people within his own people. So what does that teach us? You see, you can have the Spirit of God working in your life, but it doesn't mean you are righteous. The Spirit of God can work in any person's life, even a non-Christian. Why? Because the Spirit does as He pleases, right? That's what the Bible says. But it doesn't mean that you are right before God. Judges 14 verse 19, we continue on. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him again. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of them and stripped them of everything and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. You know, it's interesting when uh, people that claim to be Christians go, uh, go around and go, oh yeah, that guy who uh, power lifter, he's a Christian. Or, you know, they look at Justin Bieber, like, he's a Christian. Steph Curry, he's a Christian. He shoots like balls and then, that, you know, they land in time every single time. And that's why, because God blesses him. It's like, yeah, it doesn't mean he is a Christian doesn't mean he's right with God. It's just God working 
because God wants to work. You know, Samson was able to do amazing feats because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. In and of himself, Samson was nothing special outside of being chosen. That's the only special thing about Samson is that he was chosen. And you know what's so special about everyone in this room as well? You are chosen by God. Absolutely you are. And the only person that chooses not to be chosen is you. (laughs) You know, what made him special or powerful was that God put a spirit on him at all times. And I love it. It says, whenever the spirit was on him, it says the spirit went on him powerfully. And that's how the spirit works. It doesn't work, you know, in a timid, you know, fluffy, puffy way. It's it's powerfully. You know, we also have the spirit permanently. In 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 7, it says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. You know, are you still timid in the ways that you work? Are you letting the Spirit of of God work powerfully in your life? Or are you resisting the Spirit working in your life by resisting His calling to change? If you are resisting the call to change, then you are resisting the Spirit of God. Make no mistake, God is not a fluffy, puffy God. When you come to Him, He expects you to change. Yeah. You know, whenever people come to God, there had to be an altar they had to sacrifice on, right? The word altar is also meant to alter something in your life, you know? But are you resisting the Spirit of God? You know, I love Kentucky Fried Chicken. Who loves Kentucky Fried Chicken? Oh, yeah. KFC, baby. All day, every day. Um, but uh, funny enough, I found out this guy, I, I think it's Colonel, how they say it? Uh, Harlan Sanders, right, created the whole KFC. And funny enough, uh, if you read up on his story, he was denied a thousand and nine times his recipe that he made. So he made a recipe and he was like, this is my secret recipe. It's going to become the greatest recipe ever. And he goes to about a thousand different other stores and a thousand different other companies going, guys, you guys should take my recipe. It's going to be awesome. They just turned him down. And at 60 years old, he was going around offering it to places. And he got to the point where he was like, oh, now I'm just tired. You know what? I'm just going to start it myself. And then he goes on and starts it himself. And it has grown to what we see today as KFC. Which is finger licking good. Are you guys with me? And I looked it up and it says by 2022. Sorry. um, Before 2022, he died at the age of 90 years old. And by that time, there were 6,000 KFC stores in 48 different countries. And by 2002, I mean, this is, he's dead. It's still growing. It says there are 25,000 different KFC stores all around the world in 147 countries. I mean, KFC has evangelized the world. Have they not? They have. But see, that's a man working without the Spirit of God. Wow. How, how much more with you with the Spirit when it works powerfully in your life? Mm-hmm. You know, you can impact one person's life. And you can tell them, hey, taste and see that the Lord is better than finger licking good. You know what I mean? Because the promise, you know, the promise of the Bible is that taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. And I think he got that, you know, slogan from the Bible because he saw it in any ways. But anyways, you know, you've got to allow the Spirit of God to work in your life. Yeah. But you can't do that unless you know what the Spirit is saying through the, the sword of the Spirit, and that's the Bible. Right. You know, my encouragement is study the Bible. You know, what are some keys to unlocking the Spirit's power in your life? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 26. Firstly, we live by the Spirit. It says, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, 
Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. You know, you've got to live by the Spirit of God. The second thing is, we've got to set your mind, or set our minds, on spiritual living. In Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 8, it says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You know, I want to lift up our sister Naki, who's not here with us today. So she has had a, a serious um, uh, uh, operation that she had on Wednesday, which has disabled her to be able to come, you know, to meetings for the next uh, maybe two weeks or so forth. But prior to her operation, I think on a Monday night, she was going to have it on Wednesday this past week. Monday night, she sent out this long email to me, Millie, and other people in the church. And they were going, guys, I want you to keep me accountable for the next couple of days. Because I know I'm going to struggle spiritually. Because I'm not going to come to church. Because this is what's going to really keep me from doing it. Um, but I've set up time to pray with this sister, that sister, this sister. And I've set up time to do Bible studies with this sister and whatnot. I'm still going to be on uh, meet up to evangelize and you know set up Bible studies and whatnot. But I also, and then she, at the end of it she was like, but I also want to encourage you guys. Please, don't be afraid to push me. Because I know I'm going to make excuses for my condition. And I know that I, I'm, I'm going to give a reason why I don't want to do or read my Bible or do anything spiritual. So please push me. That's the mind of a person governed by the Spirit. Yeah. Oh, I'm a Christian because I evangelize. No, it's about loving the lost. Right. Ask yourself, when was the last time you brought someone to church? Come on. Ask yourself, when was the last time you studied the Bible with someone? When was the last time you converted someone from the darkness they were in to the light? Right. It's about loving the lost. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it was awesome just sharing our faith yesterday, right? Yes. Uh, I think that idea works better, you know? Like, we get here and go, okay, this is a target, and we won't leave until we're done. Yes. But it gets you really, you know, uh, I know I was speaking to Ian, it was like, yeah, it had me really focused, you know? But it gets you, but it gets you really, like, praying to God, like, God, I don't want to be out here for, like, three hours. Please, help me, you know? I, I prayed that prayer silently as I was going with Hila yesterday, and uh, I think God rebuked me. <laughs> Because <laughs> I was like, God, I don't want to be here two hours. Please give me. And then at the end of it, I was, it was almost going to two hours. I was like, okay, my heart is wrong. God, up to you what you want to do. But help me love the lost. And then the next person I met, I got a contact, you know. You got to set your mind on overcoming your sinful nature. And you got to give and give and give. Yeah. You know, in order to become like our Savior and not like Samson, we need to take captive every evil thought you have. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says, We take captive every thought to make obedience right. to Christ. Point number three, God wants to answer your prayers in an amazing way. Yes. And if you tell Sarah that, she'll say, Amen. Yes. Judges 15, verse 15 and 19, it says, Finding a fresh bone of, sorry, fresh jawbone of a donkey. He grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramath Lehi. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? I mean, this guy was a brat. It says, Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. So the spring was called en Hakor, and it's still there in Lehi. You know, how amazing is God's grace? He allows a man to speak to him like that. And you know what the great thing about God? He still answers his prayer. Wow. After hard days of fighting, Samson forgets to think thoroughly through his personal needs. You know, sometimes as Christians, we love to be focused on missions so much that we, our personal lives can kind of spin out of control. Right? That's why I preach every single time. Guys, have an hour-by-hour -hour schedule. You gotta, you can't, you gotta stop being immature and living in a in a children, you know, phase that you were in where you didn't need a schedule. Mom and dad had it for you. Um, and even as as adults, we can still be children and go, okay, my 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 work has my schedule for me. I know what I'm doing based on my work schedule. No, you gotta have an hour by hour schedule yourself to live out God's amazing plan for you guys. You know, they love to have their times with God, evangelize, baptize, and then neglect their finances. 
I think that's a big thing that we can uh, be a downfall for us is that, okay, I'm going to be righteous in all these things but not be righteous in my finances. You know, righteousness, the meaning of the word righteousness, it means to fulfill every relationship and responsibility in your life. That includes finances. You know, household duties. You know, when you look at your household, does it reflect the fact that you're lazy or you're hardworking or does it reflect that you are homey and are loving? I love that, you know, last night we were at the Mount Eden Sisters household. We were there and, we were, and I was like, man, this is, a, this is a household. This is what I'm talking about. You know, non-Christians rock in. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is my friend Millie. You know, she owns this house. And, you know, what do you think of the house? You know, it's like, it's an awesome property. It's like, it wasn't even my house. You know, and I was joking with the brothers. It's like, maybe we should uh, ask them to move out and me and Jenna move in. You know, and, uh, it's a minute. And, uh, you know, it was a joke. But you, you went around and you were like, man, this is what we're talking about. This is a godly household right here. You know, relationships, work, or studies. You know, all of these things we can sometimes lead to spin out of control, and it causes a lot more problems and lots of emotions. Yeah. I remember when I first became a disciple, and I was so like, you know, talk about zeal without knowledge. I was so zealous. I was like, I just want to baptize someone. You know, for the first year, I set myself a goal. I am going to get fruitful in that year. And so I had a plan. And it was a stupid plan. I decided to skip my courses, skip my lectures, go only to the tutorials, and just go out and evangelize and study the Bible with people. Uh, number one, it almost had me failing that semester. It wasn't good. And number two, I ended up baptizing no one in that whole first year. Why? Because God saw clearly I wasn't being righteous. I was supposed to fulfill my responsibility by being in class. Right? Now, some of us, you know, we need to do the opposite. Where we spend more time in our classes and in our other responsibilities than saving souls. Yeah. Where we have no problem skipping a Bible study or postponing a person saving someone's soul or not phoning them up to come for the sake of assessments, tests, our classes, the list goes on. No, we got to do both. And you got to learn to, it's a learned skill. You need to learn to master it. So if you don't master it, don't feel down in yourself and go, oh, I'm sinful. You are sinful, right? You just need to learn how to master both. Yeah. Now, some of us, we need to master the other side, the finances, you know, and the, the studies and whatnot. Uh, but never fear. Whatever it is, never fear. Why? Because God answers even Samson's, sorry, not Simon's, uh, emotional prayer. I think I had it in there, Simon. Just like us today. You know, I appreciate our sister Sarah who just came up and shared communion. Talk about the year of miracles, baby. Yeah. I mean, she had a loan of about 30 grand. And, and, uh, and I remember she came earlier uh, to me this year and she goes, hey, I need to work during the Christmas break um, because I need to make money to pay for my loan. And I was like, okay, should I say yes or no? It's like, hey man, sounds about right. But in this past two years, she's seen her loan grow by, I think about five or seven grand or maybe even more than that. And she was like, what am I doing? What, am I, what, what do I do? Well, forwards it to God. God out of nowhere just suddenly cancels it and now she's debt free. Wow. And what makes you think that God can't cancel your debt? Wow. All right. And sometimes it takes a little longer because God is trying to teach you a lesson. You see, God wants to answer your prayers in an amazing, yeah. amazing way. Point number four and last and final point. God will give you amazing strength. Come on. In Judges 16 verse 3 it says, But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he, so now he's in prison, right? Now he's being enslaved. He's lost his strength. He's lost everything. And then he says, Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose by and all. He lifted them to his sh shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Sorry, this is, uh, this is before he was uh, enslaved. And uh, you can see that he already has the strength. But then he goes through a period where he loses his strength. And now he's enslaved. And then it says in verse 29 to 30, it says, Then Samson reached toward the central pillars, the two central pillars, on which the temple stood. This is the temple of the Philistines, of their uh, god named Dagon. And then it says, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and the left on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. You know, it's so sad when you think about it. Samson achieved more by dying than he did when he was living. 
Now, there is a biblical prin uh, principle to that. But at the same time, he probably could have done so much more with his life had he been righteous. Now, even for you, yeah, you may be having a great job and great careers and great, you know, opportunities, university and whatnot, but you haven't even experienced how great it really will be unless you are righteous. You know, we get stronger as we grow spiritually and super strong. I mean, in both these instances, there is no mention of the Spirit of the Lord coming on Samson, right? Samson had grown by God's will into a powerful man. So he grew because of all the lessons that God had put in front of him. You know, just like us as Christians, we grow beyond any power we thought we might have when we first became Christians. If you are going through a rough time as a disciple, that is great. That is great. I think um, uh, I was talking with my wife about one brother. He was like, maybe you should re re uh, refrain back from some of the discipling and the responsibilities you're giving him. You know, Jenna being a mom, she's like, it seems like it's just causing him to be unhappy. He's like, no, I'm going to pile on more. I'm going to allow him to be unhappy and because I, I want to squeeze out every single thing that's in him. So then we can deal with it bit by bit and then he'll become more joyful and happier and God. But that's how God trains people. Like he places you through hardship so that he can squeeze what really is in you so to save you. You know, um, this past week uh, we've been visiting our, our family a bit more. Um, so my brother Jake is with us here in the service. And, uh, and uh, I went to pick him, so you can pick him up because um, one of my cousins was taking care of him. And now he's uh, staying with us in Lije. So we have a packed house. Uh, Jenna came from the party last night with a bunch of food. He's like, yeah, well, I got three men I've got to take care of. You know, it's like, amen. And uh, Lije woke up and had barbecue. You know, that's, 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 that's a man's meal, you know. But um, anyways, uh, we, we went to, so my family had a farewell uh, uh, dinner party for my um, brother on Friday. And so went there and I spoke with them. And it's funny, some of these cousins I was with, I grew up with them. And uh, we, you know, you know how Samoans are. We always joke and mock each other and pull each other down and whatnot. And then when I was there, uh, not too long ago as well, when I saw them, it was the same thing. And then when I was there, there was none of that. It was very interesting. They just started speaking to me about deep life topic stuff. Like, you know, and uh, my, my cousin who works uh, uh, security in, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Auckland Uni, he was like, yeah, man, like I'm, I'm working in this uh, new place that I uh, got promoted for. And I spent years just not giving it a shot. And, uh, and then I just realized, what am I doing? So being so fearful about it. He said, because I couldn't even go to sleep because I was like, they were trying to offer me the position to get promoted, but I was so fearful I might mess it up. And so he goes, man, I learned something so big in life at that time. It's like, man, I just need to take risks. Um, but then you talk with them and they talk about all these serious life topics. And I'm like, man, my, my cousins have really changed. And then at the root of it, they mentioned that, man, I, I'm so, I, I so appreciate the fact that you decided to live for God. Um, you have no idea. But we respect you a lot. Um, the things that you've done. Um, it's made us encourage us to take risks because it's like man some of the things you did man like obviously from our culture it's a no-brainer you don't turn down your parents you don't turn down you know your family and whatnot for God you don't do that but you gave us the courage to do that and you taught us a lot yeah. and I was you know I was in that awkward moment where I was like should I crack a joke here you know I was like no just shut up and just say thank you you know <laughs> But they were, just, they were just sharing their hearts out. But see, them seeing the impact and the life that I'm living made them go, I need to take my life seriously. Yeah. But you see, you cannot live that type of lifestyle if you're still waiting for the permission of your parents to do something for God. Yeah. If you're still waiting for them to say yes, for you to move. No, you need to grow up to be a man, be a woman, live for God. Yeah. And you'll see the when, when, when God does amazing things in your life, it doesn't just stop with you. And I mean, these cousins, I haven't seen them in the past 10, 13 years. And yet they've seen from afar what God is doing. Is that me? No, it's God. All I ever did was decided, I'm going to surrender God. I don't like it, but I'm going to surrender. You know, that could be you as well. You know, we get God-given strength. In 1 Peter 4, verse 11, it says, If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things, God may be praised through Christ Jesus. In Exodus 15, verse 2, it says, The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. 
You know, how the weak become strong is by going through hardships. Yeah. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, it says, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, one of the great things about God is that He loves working with weak people to turn them into being strong people. Amen. Why? Because only He can do that. And he loves it. The only thing he needs from you is a full wholehearted commitment. Right. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, it says, God looks and his eyes are all over the earth, mm. looking for people that his hearts are fully committed to him yeah. so that he can strengthen them. Yeah. You see, we don't get strength out of nowhere. We get strength when we become fully committed to God. Yeah. You know, and it's so awesome because today the Lord is going to give strength to a special woman named Dolly. <laughs> And she has come today with a decision. She's going to be fully committed to the Lord. You know, she's given up uh, the idea of having to live for her parents, the idea of having to live for her family. She's given up living for her culture, living for anything else or anyone else's opinion. But only living based on the opinion of the Word of God. And mark my words, guys, if she continues in that, you will see how the Lord will rise and make her go from weak to being strong and to go on to be stronger. And to go on to be the strongest she will ever be. We honor you today, our sister. You know, God, God can do anything incredible in your life. But it comes down to you making the decision to accept the amazing grace of God and be fully committed. You know, I shared a little bit about my life, right? And uh, tomorrow I turn seven years spiritually in the faith. And uh, seven years the Lord has molded me. Uh, anything good or great that you see in me is what the Lord has done. I absolutely, I don't say that like a religious person on TV, like how they say it to try to be fluffy. And I say that I can sit down with you and tell you the specifics of what God has done. I have grown from being a weak little minded boy to being an emotionally stronger man. I'm not the strongest getting there, right? But I'm way more stronger than where I was. I may be physically weaker, but I'm spiritually stronger. I may be physically smaller, but I'm emotionally a lot more bigger than where I was. And that's where God can take you. You know, in just seven years, God has done the impossible in my life. Uh, he's allowed me to lead two churches, marry an incredible woman, right? Um, impacted my family in so many ways. My sister has become a disciple. My cousin is a disciple too. Uh, we're still going for my mom and all my other siblings and whatnot and all my cousins. So I'm coming for you guys, you know? But God has done so many different things in my life just because out of one decision of accepting His amazing grace. You know, in conclusion, the amazing grace, the miraculous life of Samson. Point number one, God has an amazing plan for your life. Point number two, God gives you an amazing spirit. You know, three, God wants to answer your prayers in an amazing way. God will give you amazing strength. The only thing that's standing between you and that is yourself. To God be the glory.